Yeah. On the stuff that for checking, like ask, call to unmute, mute participants upon entry. Is there anything we check won't need to check off or or allow to happen? Yeah, they want to um uh they want to be muted on entry. Okay. Yeah. Where do you see that? Uh on the participants page down on the bottom there's more. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yep. Yeah, they're all checked. Uh the ones that are checked, just leave them as they are. Mute participants upon entry. Allow participants to unmute themselves. Allow participants to rename themselves. Yeah, enable waiting room. Um and if anything really bad happens uh, you can you can end the meeting right you know, like I don't know if you were at the meet I think you were at the meeting where we where we got hacked yeah all right so you see that um, down the bottom there's uh, there's a whole bunch of things you've got your microphone on the left and then stop video security right. uh, participants you go over to the right where it says more, um, when you click on more, in red it says end. So you can just, you can end the meeting if something bad happens. Okay. You see that? Um. Let's see, as. Maybe it'll stop it security. Um, yeah, keep on going over to the right. And you, you'll see three little buttons and more underneath it. Um, you don't see it next to remote control? Um, let's see. I uh, got a button that says leave. Oh, uh, so you don't, maybe you don't, maybe as the co-host, you don't have the option of, um, um, of um, ending the meeting. Maybe mm -hmm. it's the host. Yeah, because I'm not uh, seeing anything. Yeah, yeah. I don't I'm not sure how Robert was doing it, whether whether he was um, doing it as a co-host or another host. But, I'm yeah. not sure. Um, but anyway, you won't have to worry about that. If there's any problems, Nancy can end the meeting. You know how to end the meeting, right, sweetheart? Yeah, just come in for a second. I know. All right. Um, down the bottom there on the right hand side, if there's a problem, you just end the meeting. When, right. when, under more? Yeah, under more. Yeah. When, when you're finished with your talk, you're going to make Isaac the host. Okay. Because, Should we let Isaac go first or no? No. No. I've already talked to him. Um, he's fine with about 20 past eight. So you do your talk and then when you finished, pass it over to Isaac, uh, make him the host. And when Isaac's finished, he's going to make me the host. Um, and that'll be it. Did you change, uh, maybe Nancy, you should change the WCAC president or something? Why? Because I don't like my name there. Well, that's what you wanted it. No, usually just put WCAC president. Well, why did I change it to that? 
Mm -hmm. You told me to change it to that. No, just put WCAC president. Because that's how I'm listed on the program. Uh, okay. Um, There's only one person waiting to get in. It starts yeah. in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, should we let that guy in? No, not yet. No. Because then he'll hear our chatter. All right. There's going to be a flurry. We expect about 20 people or so. Not a lot. Well, actually, there's probably more than that. Um, we had, I counted 26 this morning. Well, how do we know who's allowing them in when they come in? Chris. Chris what, yes. How does he know who's pre-registered or not? Well, I don't that's the only way they can get in, is if they pre-registered. That's the only way they can get in. All right. I just don't know how that works. But what I've told Chris is that if there's anybody there that um, has a weird looking name, like a device. Yep. You know, like iPhone 7 yeah. or iPad, you right. know, not to let them in. Just <laughs> just hit the remove button. Right. Um, other than that, um, we should just let everybody else in. All right, I'll be back in a second, Chris. I'm giving it to Isaac. I'm just changing the host. Isaac. Yeah. Just in case I have a problem. You don't need to be down there. Oh, I've got to get my stuff ready. Well, then when Isaac's on, do it when Isaac, or when I'm almost done. Where are you living these days? Uh, we're uh, on a street called Pioneer Road, which is actually uh, is right off 29 and a half in Patterson. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we actually seems out this way, there's not all that much in the way of bright lights, even though we're fairly close to the airport that we're able to see. Uh, uh -huh. We're seeing a lot more stars than. Uh -huh. So. See the scope up in the backyard? Uh, well, I have to set up out uh, in the driveway by the street. Um, there's a lot of trees in the back area, so. Why don't you start letting people in? It's five of them. There's All right. Yeah. yeah. Let's start letting people right. in. Welcome. Yeah. Come in. So our camera's off, right? Yep. What's showing on our screen? Mm -hmm. Just my slide? Mm hmm now we have to get you are screen sharing, but we're, shouldn't the presentation be up there? It is. That's what it's showing. What are you? Um, hey, welcome, guys. Aaron, Neil, Adrienne, and Sarah. Uh, we'll be starting the event in a few minutes. Um, can you see, what can you see on the screen, Chris? Can you see Nancy's um, welcome, welcome slide. slide? It's got welcome Western. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Page up, page up. Oh. Uh, yeah, I guess. Just yeah. hit one for a minute. Um, 
not doing anything. It's not doing anything, is not it? Not over there, it's not. Not over there. Did the slide just change or not? Uh, no, it's still, still the same about, one. What about now? No. Um, still, oh, still no change. That's weird. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. PowerPoint slideshow. Not changing. Did change screens and then back to the first one. It changed? Yeah, but then went back to the first one. That's because he stopped presenting. But now it's back. It should be on, it should be changing to the third, second and third slide, um, but it's not doing it for some reason. All right, we had this problem last time, so what I'm going to do is we're going to use um, I'm going to use some JPEGs for slides. It was changed in slides there, there just a second ago. Okay. You see the first slide now? Uh, it's got the, uh, the, uh, Welcome. The, no, it's got the, uh, it's on the, uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's displaying the entire presentation, all of the slides at once. Yeah. In the menu part of it. What about now? Now it's back to the intro slide. Charlie yeah. has his. Yeah. So I think yep, now it's on the second one. Uh, Tonight's program. Here we go. Houston, we have contact. Yep. Um, do we have any people in the waiting room, Chris? Uh, no, not now. Um, Isaac was and John Garlic for the last two days. Okay. Uh, Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Grand Mesa Observatory. I wish the circumstances were different, uh, but um, I'm hoping that once this nightmare is over, that we'll be able to um, resume back to having public events. Um, and, you know, hopefully from, from next year, I think we've got like 11 people waiting. Oh, no, they're all in now. I they're think. the participants. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to hand you over to Nancy, the um, WCAC club president, who's going to um, introduce tonight's event. Is that on and have a yep. scroll between yep. arrow keys? Yep. Okay. Okay, hi, welcome everybody to, um, as Terry said, it's unfortunate we've been not able to have um, club meetings in person or any public stargazing events. The main reason for that, of course, is when you have telescopes, you have eyepieces and you cannot sterilize eyepieces in between people. And we certainly don't wanna be responsible for anybody getting sick. So we're trying the best we can to um, share astronomy news and events um, as over the course of this season and hopefully maybe by next season everything will be back where we can actually have things in person at the observatory and club meetings. This isn't working. The white arrow. All right, it's not working. Well, it was. <laughs> Hang on folks, technical difficulties. Which one? The arrow? Yes. Key. Okay, can everybody see the slide with tonight's program schedule? Yes. Okay. Yes, All right. So, um, we, uh, I just like to ask anybody, um, if you're participating, to mute your um, microphone. If you have any questions during the presentation, just uh, hit your unmute button and just ask me a question. I'd be happy to answer. So tonight, um, we're just going to have a short, we usually have a little short program. We can't do any live stargazing. So I chose International Observe the Moon Night because that's next weekend. So I'm going to talk a bit about the moon. And I also will mention some summer and autumn objects that you can check out in the sky if you want to take your binoculars or your telescope outside. Then Terry, the observatory director, We'll give you a virtual tour of Grand Mesa Observatory here. Isaac Garfinkel will then talk about um, the Grand Mesa Observatory outreach that we do. And I believe at the end, Terry's going to also do a simulation of sky imaging. We still have soot and, uh, and smoky skies up here, so we can't open our observatory roof, unfortunately. And clouds. And clouds, not to mention, so. Okay, can everybody now see the picture of the moon? Are we good here? Okay, I'll assume that we yeah. are. Not yes, we, we do have them. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to talk a bit about um, the Earth's only one natural satellite, which is the moon. So I'll start with the basics and the current theory of where the moon actually came from is that there was a giant collision between Earth and a Mars-sized astronomical body about 4.5 billion years ago which spl uh, splashed off a lot of molten um, uh, ejecta into um, the, uh, around the Earth, and that recoalesced to form the moon. The reason they think this is because the moon rocks that have been analyzed are similar in composition to those of the Earth. So that is the current theory of where the moon came from. And I also in like to include some fun stuff. So here's some fun facts about the moon. So what's the temperature on the moon? When the sunlight hits the moon's surface, the temperature can reach up to about 260 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's even hotter than Grand Junction. Um, when the sun goes down, however, temperatures can also go in the opposite direction, down to about minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit. So you have quite the number of extremes on the moon. So if you visit there, pack a lot of clothing. Um, some other fun facts about the moon. We all pretty much have seen the space-suited astronauts. The moon has no atmosphere whatsoever, not even a thin one. Can you move back a bit? Apparently it's muffling the mic a bit. Okay. If you could fly to the moon on the something the speed of a passenger jet, it would take about 16 days to get there. And as most people know, the tides here on the Earth are largely caused by the gravitational pull of the moon. The moon is about one quarter of the size of the Earth, 27% to be more exact. And the effect of gravity on the moon is only about one fifth as strong on the surface of the moon compared to the strength of gravity on Earth. 
thus the astronauts that visited there were able to do some pretty good gymnastics uh, leaping up off the surface. And when we see drawings of the Earth and Moon, astronomically speaking, they look really close together, but they're actually really far apart by Earth standards. The Moon is about 239,000 miles away, and that equates to about 30 Earth circumferences. And why we say the average distance, because the Moon uh, go, does not orbit in a perfect circle, it's in an elliptical orbit. So when it's the furthest away, it's about 32 Earth widths apart. And when it's the closest, the moon is about 28 or 29 Earth widths away. So you see it shifts quite, um, quite a bit. And also, as we know, sometimes we're lucky to be treated when the moon passes into the Earth's shadow, creating a lunar eclipse. And if you've never gotten to see one, I highly recommend the next time one comes around that's visible from here that you try to check it out. The moon looks very dimensional when it's um, in, under the eclipse colors. And if you look at it through a binocular telescope, it's pretty amazing. So what does the other side of the moon look like? It's actually not called the dark side, it's called the far side. The other side is equally lit as this side. We just can't see it and why that is because the moon is tidally locked to the earth because it rotates in exactly the same time as it takes to orbit the earth. So although a lot of explorers robotic are on the other side of the moon, we only get to see one side of it unless, you know, when the astronauts went up there and orbited the moon, they of course got to see the other side. But from here on earth, we see the same side all the time. A lot of people, this is just a little fun slide, say that they can't see the man in the moon. So this illustration just shows you, if you look at the two big dark patches up top, are the eyes and then the nose is the dark spots in the middle and the mouth is the lower dark area. Um, so if you wanna see the man in the moon, that's him. So actually our moon does really have a name and the name of our moon is Luna. A lot of people don't know that. And uh, another question, how many humans have actually been on the moon? Well, there have been 12 astronauts that walked on the moon's surface of, of, of um, and then six of those drove the lunar ro rover vehicles. And a few people went there more than once, but we basically had nine Apollo missions to the moon between December of 68 and December of 72. And the bonus note is that the first set person to set foot on the moon was Neil Armstrong. July 20th, 69, and he famously said that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. So it'd be fun to think about if you got to be a person walking on the moon or the first person to walk on Mars, what would you say when you got there? So the reason we're talking about the moon is because next weekend, September 26th to be exact, is International Observe the Moon Night 2020. And this is um, something that um, you, can, you can basically do um, from just about anywhere because the moon is visible from uh, lit skies or dark skies or wherever you can still see it. So some of the features that you want to observe on the moon, now some of these you can see naked eye, but of course if you use binoculars or better yet a telescope, you can get close up views. The moon is fascinating. You can spend hours and hours and nights and nights under different lighting conditions seeing different features. So some of the things we look at are called maria and these are wide dark flat areas that look like seas from a distance. That's why they got their name but they're actually solidified uh, lava or molten rock. There's uh, mountains on the moon and Mons Huygens is the moon's tallest mountain it's about 18,000 feet tall, which is more than half the height of Mount Everest. So if you only think of the moon as craters, there's mountains there too. There are also mountain ranges, and the Apennine Mountains are one of the largest mountain ranges on the moon. So you can look at them through your telescope. There's a lot of valleys, which are long depressions on the moon's surface. And although they can reach hundreds of kilometers long, they're usually only a few kilometers wide. And they're somewhat unusual because other features such as impact craters 
or rays, which are ejected from impacts, intersect them and break them into pieces. Then there's, I believe I'm pronouncing this correctly, rills, long slim depressions in the surface of the moon. And some theories on what causes these are lava channels along the surface and collapsed tubes that carried lava underneath the surface um, a very long time ago on the moon. And of course, the famous craters of the moon. The moon's surface has many craters, almost all of which were formed by impacts at one point or another in the moon's history. Now, I took some tips from the experts observing the moon from space.com. And if you have a lunar map, which of course you can get anywhere on the internet, or perhaps even a photograph of the moon as a guide, you can easily study the moon and identify a number of its most prominent features. And they recommend um, the Sky and Telescope field map of the moon that you can get in normal and reversed uh, versions. And people erroneously think that the best time to observe the moon is when it's full. And that's the actual worst time to look at it. A full moon appears very flat and one dimensional because the sun is shining directly on it and you cannot see much contrasting detail from the light to dark areas or with shadows. And in addition, the full moon can be blindingly bright, especially if you're looking through a telescope. So the very best time to observe the moon is actually two or three days after the first quarter. And that's for several reasons. It's in a fine position for evening studying. Nearly all of the major lunar features can be seen at that time. And it's not sufficiently bright to cause loss of detail because of the glare. And as a line of darkness called the Terminator recedes, uh, features near the border stand out in very bold relief and the shadows become stronger and the details and the dimensionality are much more easily seen. So this uh, one amazing lunar map created by the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Spacecraft, um, shows the handwriting's a little blurry, but it shows a lot of the larger mare or um, the dark lava beds and some of the prominent craters here. Um, a good moon map, of course, is handy to help stargazers locate interesting spots on the moon. And you can keep a list, if you want, of features that you want to observe or have observed, a lunar um, a journal of some sort, if you will. Now, the moon has no glow and doesn't emit any light of its own, but it shines with the reflected light of the sun. And during its crescent phase in the twilight or um, at dusk, you can also see the unlit or dark portion of the moon glowing faintly in the sunlight that bounces off of Earth and then bounces back off the moon. And this is called Earth shine. And I find it very intriguing to observe the Earth shine portion of the moon through a telescope. It's kind of eerie and spooky looking. So it's fun to look at the uh, crescent moon and the earth shine um, portion of it. And I borrowed this from NASA and they have 10 ways that they recommend to observe the moon for international observe the moon night. The simplest one is to just look up. The moon is the brightest object in the night sky, second brightest after the sun in the daytime. You can see it from anywhere from the remote dark deserts in Chile to the brightly lit streets of Tokyo. Um, second, of course, is to peer through a telescope or binoculars. And with the magnification, you'll be able to focus in on special features on the moon, like the Sea of Tranquility. You can get maps and look for the landing sites of the, um, all the Apollo missions and put those on your list or the bright uh, uh, Copernicus craters or some of the other interesting craters of which there are many. You can either look at photographs of the moon or take your own. The LRO has taken more than 20 million images of the moon, mapping it in stunning detail. So you can look online and see featured um, uh, uh, captured images on the LRO website. And of course you can take your own photos from Earth. And it's pretty easy to do. You can even use cell phones to do it if you set, set them properly. You can also take a virtual field trip with something called Moon Trek, which is an interactive moon map um, made using NASA data from spacecraft. And you can fly anywhere you like on the moon, um, calculate distances, mountain elevations, take a lunar hike, um, 
And if you have a virtual reality headset, you can do all this in 3D. So that looks like fun. You can also do the feel uh, approach. And you can, if you have access to a 3D printer, you can look at NASA's library of 3D models and lunar landscapes and perhaps create your own and feel your way around the moon. Um, you can also make moon art. There's a lot of artwork that's been dedicated to the moon and or you can create your own if you're in an artistic uh, mood. And then there is the infamous uh, relaxing on your own couch. And uh, a lot of us armchair astronomers like to take some time to do that. There's a bunch of movies back from the old sci-fi days that feature the moon um, listed here. Of course, Apollo 13 was a more recent movie. Then you get the old Jules Verne and First Man in the Moon. So there's a lot of movies that feature the moon. Um, you can also spend your evening with NASA's lunar playlist on YouTube or their video gallery and learning about the moon's role in eclipses, looking at the phases of the moon and seeing the latest um, science there in high resolution. You can also listen to the moon, use all your senses. You can make a playlist of moon songs. Uh, you, again, NASA is a great resource for anything astronomical. They have a list of lunar tunes and you can also watch their own uh, LRO video, music video uh, back in the MTV mode. It's called The Moon and More. You can also see the moon through the eyes of spacecraft. Uh, visible light is the only thing that we can see. But of course, a lot of the NASA spacecraft contain different types of instruments that can analyze the moon's composition and environment. You can review the gravity field with data from the GRAIL spacecraft or look at slope maps from the laser altimeter on board LRO. So there's a lot of science. The moon is very visual, it's artistic, and there's a lot of science. So there's a lot to do relating to the moon and it's more fascinating than you might think. And you should continue your observations throughout the year. Um, one of the special things about the moon is that it changes even over the course of hours as to what you can see because the light changes so quickly that more and more features become uh, visible under certain light and there's an X on the moon and there's other shapes that you can only see at certain phases of the moon. So with your lunar maps, you'll be able to know when to um, look for those. So observe the moon all year long, not just on, on that special night of observe the moon and you will have endless hours of fascination. I just put a little bit about sky events in September. I'm continuing to talk about Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. Um, they're all still very prominent in the night sky, but they're getting lower, so you don't want to miss them over the season. Mars uh, is approaching opposition and getting brighter and brighter. So um, between September 29th and October 28th, it'll actually bypass Jupiter as the second brightest planet in the sky and become the third brightest object in, in the sky. Um, September, oh, so I think we passed this one already. Uh, I did take that out already, so never mind about that one. We missed that one. So just again, through a telescope, small telescope, you can see Jupiter and some of its larger moons. It's to the left of the constellation Sagittarius, uh, the teapot asterism. So you can watch it pretty readily. You also get a great view of the Milky Way this time of year. Saturn's still very visible, second largest planet in our solar system. And it now has the most moons at um, bringing its total up to about 82. And now Jupiter has taken second spot with 79. And Earth, of course, only has one, so poor Earth. This is website information about Grand Mesa Observatory. If anybody wants to get in touch with us, you can look for upcoming events on that website. Again, they won't be any live ones for a while, probably till next season. And the Western Colorado Astronomy Club. Um, we are having virtual online club meetings the first Tuesday of every month with speakers on interesting topics. So check out our website to keep on top of any other astronomy events going on. And I think that's all for me. So I am going to pass it over to Isaac, who is actually going to. All right. Before I do that, does anybody have any questions? 
No questions about the moon. Okay. Well, probably lots of them, but you'll get to observe it for yourself and answer them. So I am going to switch it over to Isaac. I am going to make him coach, should we host or co host? <laughs> All right. Isaac is now the host and he's talking about uh, outreach. Uh, it still says I'm viewing your screen. Yeah, I'll just shut it off. Shut it off. All right, there we go. Let me uh, and I'm muting pull up our website for you guys. All right, do you see the, uh, I'm on the website now? Can I get a yay or a nay? Yes, yes we do. All right, perfect. All right, so Grand Mesa Observatory at its core is a, a nonprofit educational facility. Um, our mission is really to spread scientific knowledge and awareness and, and STEM capability among students. Uh, you can read our formal mission here. Um, back way yonder in the day is when we used to host people in person. We would have school groups and, you know, kids of all ages from the, the local Grand Valley schools would come up here. Um, we had an internship program with schools back east and they would send a couple students out here to learn how to use, you know, like actual college age students to learn how to use the astronomy equipment. Um, we've worked with the Air Force Academy and we were really a, an established observatory that just kind of got a gut punch right as we were taking off. Um, so nowadays really our main fundraising avenues are through donations. Um, and as with any nonprofit, here's where I pitch you. If you ever feel like donating and helping support our cause, um, all goes into you know upkeep of the observatory and, and putting equipment into the hands of students. Um, you can go to this link, the donations and fundraising. Um, we have a direct donation right into our nonprofit account. Um, we also do during the year normally, again, when things are running as they should, uh, we have the option to become a volunteer if you'd rather donate your time instead of money. Um, anything from being an usher at our events to hosting you know, a telescope when we have the public star parties to you know, presenting it at functions like this. Um, all sorts of things we have needs for when we are a functioning in-person facility. So again, I'm sorry we're in such a strange time. Um, if you know of any you know, schools or places that might need our resources, uh, definitely reach out. Um, we are looking to partner with more educational facilities that can do remote astronomy work because that's a great way to get along during these times. Um, we will eventually have a fully functioning dome dedicated to just academic research. Uh, that dome has turned into something of a troublemaker, so it's not quite up and running. Uh, but when it is, it'll really be a top-notch facility. Um, as I mentioned, we have a uh, telescope in partnership with the uh, United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Uh, we're part of a very large network they have of telescopes like this all over the world. Um, we've actually been able to use this for our own purposes and with some of the academic institutions to do some research. Uh, and also to help some of the astronomers that we work with actually learn how to use this equipment. And, you know, that the Air Force Academy dome is really the closest, you know, the highest end stuff we have, uh, the old government budgets. Um, so it's really, it's cool seeing these guys get to learn how to use that equipment properly. Um, again, school programming, special events, we do those normally, but now we're still trying to do digital things. So if, you know, any classes that need some enriching online activities, we have them. Um, that's really it for now. Um, like I said, we, we appreciate any little bit you can give us, be it time, money, resources, astronomy equipment, um, if anybody has questions about what they can do during these times, definitely reach out and send us a contact message from right up in the top there. Um, this will go right to myself and to Terry. So uh, that's it for me, a little short rant here. I will send this over. Am I sending this back to you, Terry? Yeah. All right. Isaac, I just want to mention something. Um, yeah. When we're doing these online presentations, we certainly can use volunteers to do little 20 yeah. programs. Um, I know Victor has done a few, um, Spencer has done some. So if anybody wants to do a little 20 minute blurb during one of these online events or a full blown presentation for one of the club meetings, which are about 40 minutes to an hour. Uh, we I'm doing next month's. Welcome, yeah, I, Isaac is gonna do an awesome one in October. So we would welcome anyone to give either a short or long presentation. 
and share the knowledge and expertise that you have that you don't even realize you have. So we would really love to have you be a volunteer. Yeah, I'm sorry I, I glossed over that part. Um, you know, that, that is sort of the, I think of that more as the, like astronomy club function. But yes, we do need people. As, the more we do of these online events, the more people we, we need to uh, chip in. So anything you guys can do, time, speeches, presentations, whatever, please reach out. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, Isaac? Some, yes. Uh, on that uh, the Victor talking? telescope, uh, this is Vic Barton. Hey, Victor. Hey, on that uh, Falcon telescope, yeah. can, is it just the USAF that can use that or can- Yeah, that's not, that's not a, a public, like that's not something we'd rent out. Um, that really is exclusively for educational programming. So, you know, if you were like a, um, a school group that, that wanted to use it, uh, you know, put together some kind of scientific project, we can do it for that, but that's not like a, you know, take pretty pictures for the public type of telescope. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Much as we would love to use a 20 inch RC for public consumption. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? All right, well then Terry, that's back over to you, okay? Okay, thank you, Isaac. And hi everybody. Welcome uh, this evening to uh, okay. Grand Mesa yeah. Observatory. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Isaac, and thank you, um, Nancy, for your uh, presentation this evening. Um, we have a double whammy here. We've um, we've not been able to open up the observatory even to take pictures of the night sky uh, for nearly two months now, due to um, uh, first of all, we had the fire uh, from Pine Gulch, just north of Grand Junction, um, which really gave us a lot of smoke. Uh, in fact, we were getting soot and ash, so we we couldn't we couldn't open up the uh, the roof of the observatory due to uh, falling ash and soot. And now, of course, we have smoke from the wildfires on the west coast, which are really devastating. And uh, last I looked, there's been about 30 people killed in the fires. And the smoke from these wildfires is actually drifting over Europe, I believe. So it's pretty nasty. So hopefully that um, uh, the smoke will clear and we can resume operation here at the observatory, at least for remote imaging, uh, which is mainly what we do here. And of course, um, when it comes to public viewing nights, I'm really hoping that next year we can get to some form of normality. Um, because uh, unfortunately, with these Zoom meetings, you don't really get to see uh, what it's like up close. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a video of the observatory. And can everyone see that on the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, this is a side view of the main observatory, um, Grand Mesa Observatory. This is a, a 16 foot by 32 foot roll off roof. And at the moment I'm sitting in, in here, if you can see my cursor, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but there's a little roof to the left of the of the building um, to the left of that white telescope and I'm sitting right in there um, at the moment talking to you um, and uh, we are located about 28 miles south of Grand Junction at an elevation of 6,050 feet 
and under um, uh, we have some pretty pretty dark skies here uh, when it is clear and we don't have the smoke and we use all of the telescopes in this building for um, remote astrophotography taking pictures of galaxies and nebula the roof is is an automatic roof um, it is a roll-off type roof and the roof automatically opens when the sky is clear about an hour before um, total darkness and and if if the uh, the weather is good all night long the roof will stay open and it'll close uh, at sunrise uh, actually just before sunrise and on the right uh, on this um, uh, view that you see here on the screen uh, we have a weather station here so that if if the uh, weather gets bad uh, we can see the weather conditions here and the roof will automatically close the um, the hardware that we use for the roof was actually made um, in california by a company called um, interactive astronomy that make this software sky alert and sky roof and I'm just going to move now to show you inside the roll off roof. And you can see here at the moment the roof is actually just opening. Just rolling back. And this telescope that you see right here. Um, we actually have changed the setup a little bit since I took this video. Um, this is a six inch refractor made by Williams Optics that we're actually testing for them. And we also have another six inch um, telescope, um, which is the um, 150 millimeter um, sky watcher and we have these two telescopes mounted side by side and we we have on both of these telescopes um, we have QHY cameras on this particular one uh, the William Optics we have the QHY 367, which has a sensor the same as the Nikon D810A. Um, any of you that are using a DSLR, um, the camera actually doesn't look anything like a DSLR, but it's using the same type of chip. Now, the reason why it has this weird shape is because it has its own built-in cooling device called a tech cooling, and it, it helps to keep the temperature of the sensor down uh, up to about th minus 30 or minus 35 um, degrees Celsius of the ambient temperature. Um, the reason why we use the cooling device uh, to keep the sensor cool is because we are taking very long exposures, not just like your regular, you know, a DSLR during the daytime is going to take uh, an exposure at a speed of about 125th of a second or 
one two fiftieth of a second, one sixtieth of a second. Well, what we're doing here is we are taking really long exposures, um, sometimes five minutes, sometimes ten minutes, and longer, depending on uh, the object and the type of filter that we're using. And uh, we are actually a testing station for QHY, and we get to test um, a lot of their new cameras. Now, this this round device next to it is called a filter wheel, and inside here uh, we have seven different filters. We have the luminance filter which is a clear filter. And we use this in astro imaging um, to help us with contrast and detail uh, with an image. Then we have red, green, and blue, which make up just your natural color. And then we have several narrowband filters, H-alpha or hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur two. And we use these narrowband filters to take pictures of sometimes galaxies and sometimes nebula to reveal gases that we cannot see in regular color cameras. Now, each of the telescopes that we have have got a little mini computer. Uh, the mini computer that we have on each of the telescopes are manufactured by a company called Shuttle. And they, they're running, uh, we've got some that are running Windows 7, and we've got some that are running Windows 10. And this allows me access to be able to control uh, the telescopes, and it also allows our clients to be able to control the telescopes remotely. And the reason why we have it mounted on the telescope rather than, um, than separately, uh, another main reason is uh, that we can keep the cables, the USB cables down to a minimum. All of our telescope mounts except for one, uh, this one here, this is the equatorial mount ma uh, manufactured by Software Bisque oh. out of Golden, Colorado. Uh, this is the Paramount ME, uh, which is a discontinued mount now, but it has a payload or a capacity of about 150 pounds. Here we have another telescope. This is another one that we're testing for William Optics. Has a similar camera, except this one is a new monochrome camera, uh, the QHY 600, which is a 60 megapixel monochrome CMOS. Then we have here, we have a 12 and a half inch plane wave. <coughs> Uh, which is a, um, a telescope that's manufactured here in the United States. And on this one, um, we were also testing this with the QHY 600 60 megapixel um, CMOS camera. And mounted piggyback on this setup, we also have another little telescope which gives us some really uh, great results made by William Optics. Another one that we're testing for them, the Red Cat. <clears throat> this one has a focal length of 250 millimeters. And we're using it presently with a large CCD camera called the QHY 1600. And this sensor on this one has a size 21 millimeters by 27 millimeters.
and it, this is mounted on the new Paramount ME2, uh, which I think is rated to about 240 pound. Uh, they have the same mount in the uh, in the Air Force Dome, which I'll talk to you about a little bit further. Here we have a Takahashi 130 millimeter. Uh, telescope, the FSQ-130. At the moment, we've we've now put the QHY-600 on here, the monochrome, and getting some really amazing results. Here we have a pair of Takahashi E-180s. These are an eight and a half inch astrograph or Newtonian with a f2.8 corrector. And we have one of the telescopes running a monochrome camera and the other running a, a coloured CMOS. Now I'm taking out the back to show you where the roof rolls out to on this chain. And this is the motor that supports it. You can carry up to 4,000 pounds. We have this huge pole down the end there. Um, which pulls the, the roof on the chain all the way out to expose the observatory to the night sky. Down here, as you can see another dome down there, this is, this is the Air Force Dome, which I'm going to talk to you about in a few minutes. Just going to walk up the ladder here and show you down what it looks like down into the observatory. We can see the telescopes in action. Now we have a couple of telescopes here that are on Dobsonian mounts that we use for public uh, star, star uh, parties, uh, which, like I was saying earlier, I hope that we can resume next year. Uh, we take these down to the, the concrete pad and we have quite a few volunteers from the Western Colorado Astronomy Club that come up and volunteer for us. Up on top of this rock here, you can see this is our weather station. We also have an all-sky camera on here. Uh, this all-sky camera is now has just been replaced a few weeks ago by a new all-sky camera, which is being used by the Boulder University, we're doing a collaboration with them, a partnership, and uh, we're allowing them to use the roof here to um, use their all sky camera, which is used, used, being used to observe meteors. And the, I understand it that they have ser several of these. Um, setups in other universities, sorry, in other observatories in Colorado, um, the Gunnison um, Observatory, Gunnison Valley, I believe have one, and there's one over in uh, uh, Colorado Springs, I'm not sure about the others. But anyway, and you can see another dome in front of the roll-off roof, and this is our science dome. And just in front of that is the house where I live. Okay, so. Here's a view of the Takahashi E180. We have a beautiful view here, normally when we don't have smoke. Now on the wall of the observatory, you see these white screens, probably wondering what they are. Well, these are used to, uh, these are LED screens and they're used to take what we call um, uh, flat, flat frames. And what the flat frame is, is a, a picture of this LED screen um, to, um, to show the dust. When we're taking pictures, of the night sky on 
most telescopes, you're going to get dust. You can't totally eliminate that dust. And the dust appears on a regular picture as a dark or gray smudge, uh, which we call a dust mote. And it's like a round block. And so in order to eliminate that, what we do is we take a picture of this LED screen. We have to get the brightness at a, at a certain brightness level so that we can see the dust on, on the optics. And what happens is the dust on the, um, on the flat frame appears opposite to uh, what we see in the night sky. So instead of seeing a, a light gray smudge on a dark, on a black background, we see a gray smudge against a white background. So what we do is we add these pictures together uh, when we're doing the uh, pre-processing or stacking and that totally eliminates the dust. It's my little office inside here where I'm sitting at the moment. And just another view here. This mount here, whoop, I'm going to go back just a little bit. This mount here doesn't look like the other ones. As you can tell, it's, it's actually quite ancient. This mount I brought with me. Uh, when I moved to Colorado to set up Grand Mesa Observatory, uh, the mount was actually made, I think, about 1993 by Software Bisque. It's a Paramount GT1100S. It's one of only 10 that were built that has the, what they call the MKS 4000 generation electronics, which is uh, the same electronics as what the later model Paramount has. So the, it, even though it looks pretty ugly, the electronics are pretty good. It's, it's a very good mount. Now here we, we have the um, Astro Haven Dome, uh, which belongs to the Air Force Academy. Uh, and it's actually a collaboration between the Air Force Academy and the Colorado Mesa University. Um, it's part of the Falcon Telescope Network. Uh, Falcon Telescope Network have 12 of these domes uh, in different locations around the world. Um, and we're fortunate to have one here. Uh, basically, what happens is the, um, the, the telescope is used for um, students to use from the Colorado Mesa University um, and also students. This particular one is being used by a bunch of students from the New York City University and they're using it for um, exoplanet research uh, mainly and uh, I believe some photometry and the telescope that's in this one uh, is an Italian uh, Ritchie Crichton style uh, made by uh, official still air and it's mounted on a software bisque paramount ME uh, two, uh, you can't see it on here, but I think it's got like um, about eight counterweights, uh, which have to be equal to the the weight of the telescope, and I believe the weight of the telescope um, and the accessories has a little, not little, but as a five inch. A refractor as a guide scope on it, but the total weight of the equipment on here 
on the mount is about 240 pound, which is actually the full, uh, total capacity of the of the mount. So they've got it maxed right out to the limit. But it seems to work very well. Now here is a view of the entire complex. You can see the roll-off roof and um, in the center we have the science dome um, and we're just going to go for a bit of a, a walk inside the science dome as Isaac mentioned earlier we're having some bugs at the moment the um, the dome was manufactured in uh, in Canada uh, not been particularly happy with the um, the warping of the panels. We spent a lot of time uh, sorting out the uh, leveling the um, the dome on the walls, and we're having a few issues with the um, with the shutter, which the telescope peeks through to look at the night sky. I've got uh, Victor Barton, one of our club members, uh, has graciously offered to help. Um, of course, you know, things have come to a standstill since the pandemic hit. Uh, I, I was having people coming up to the observatory to help me. But of course, since then, uh, we, we're practicing social distancing and uh, it's been difficult to uh, to get the observatory finished. But next weekend, uh, Victor's coming up here and we're going to be working on the shutter and hopefully in the next few weeks we'll get it finished. Now, the, the goal is, of course, with the science dome, it's going to be used for uh, similar... Uh, things as the as the um, Air Force Dome we're going to be using it for uh, photometry and exoplanet research and uh, spectroscopy uh, and it's going to be available for use not only by our science team at the New York City University, but uh, to other universities around the country. Uh, any student that's got a, a worthwhile scientific project, they can contact me or Isaac at the observatory and we'll consider any proposal. But um, yeah, it's a little bit premature yet. Hopefully in a few weeks time, we'll, we'll have this beast working. Okay, so that's that's about it for the tour of the observatory. Now, what what we would normally do at this stage is I would show everyone um, some objects that we are able to shoot in the night sky, but. Uh, Unfortunately, we've got we've got cloudy skies, and I don't know what's happened here. Can everybody see me still or hear me? I've lost the Zoom page. Yes, yes I, can I can see you. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Oh, here we go. I've got it back. All right, so. Yeah, normally what I would do at this point in time is I would um, show a, a few objects that we're capturing with one of the telescopes or photographing. But we can't do that tonight because number one, it's it's cloudy and, um, and we've got the smoke. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what um, software that we use and I'm going to show you a few pictures that we've taken 
at the observatory just recently. Okay, first, can everybody see um, that planetarium, the sky X on my screen? Yes. Okay, so you can see the planetarium, great. All right, this planetarium that you see in front of you, um, this software is called the sky X. And this is the proprietary software that we have to use for um, uh, the mounts that are made by software best, the paramount. This, this particular one that you're looking at, uh, we're actually looking at the, uh, uh, at the computer on the Takahashi 130FSQ. And um, um, and and the, this is a, um, uh, a planetarium uh, of what we of the objects that we see in tonight's sky. Now, when I'm when I'm using the Sky X, I'm actually controlling the telescope or the telescope mount. Uh, with this software and so I just have to go to the telescope tab and I go up here and I hit connect telescope all right now um, before I can use the telescope what I have to do is I have to send it to home position but I'm not going to send it to home position because the roof is closed and if I send it to home position, the telescope's going to crash into the roof and we don't want that to happen. So I'm just going to leave it turned off there. Actually, I'm going to go here to park the telescope and it's not actually moving the telescope because the telescope didn't, didn't move, but the all of the telescopes we have parked in a horizontal position so that they're not going to collide with the roof. All right, so when we have got the mount connected and we've sent the mount, mount to home position, and the home position is a, a predetermined position in the southwestern night sky at zero declination, two hours, <clears throat> two hours west of um, the meridian, which is this vertical line, this vertical brown line, and it's about over here somewhere, where I just clicked on the planetarium and once the mount is connected to the sky x i can either go to an object which i can click on over here just right click on it and i can i can move the mount we call it slewing we can slew the mount and the telescope to that object just by clicking on this button here. Or we can just enter the name of the object in here. Like that and just click on find and it's going to find the object over here. And then we just slew it. And then we, um, we want to be able to center the object. So we, once we've gotten close to the, to the object, we'll click on this closed loop slew. And what the closed loop slew does is it takes two photographs of the object. Uh, one is which, where the telescope is actually pointing at after the telescope has slewed it 
and then the second photograph is taken once the sky x has calculated the position of the object uh, from the first photograph now the the software that i use for taking pictures i can i can either use the sky x or i can use maxim maxim will integrate with um, with the sky x so that's the way i prefer to do it because i can take pictures with maxim and once the sky x is connected to maxim it will also be taking a photograph now this particular object um, that we are looking at here is the veil nebula we have now some of you may may have seen pictures of this in magazines or on the on the internet and you probably think well yeah this doesn't look anything like what what you see um, on the internet and basically what happens is when when we are photographing an object we're taking these long exposures this particular one is an image shot using the hydrogen alpha filter and the exposure time for this was 10 minutes long and i think when i uh, was capturing this I, I think i captured about 24 10 minute long exposures in hydrogen alpha and what we do is we use this software called pix insight there's many other different types of um, stacking software or pre-processing software that you can use but we, we stack all these images together um, and if we have 24 10 minute exposures uh, that equals uh, a total exposure length of 240 minutes and so by taking multiple exposures of the same objects it's giving us a lot more signal and detail within the image and i'll show you what this image looks like um, after it's been processed it doesn't look anything like this bear with me a moment can you see this on your screen the the website can everybody see that yes okay all right so this is a um this is the same the same picture after post processing so we've got we've got two steps in the processing we've got the pre-processing which we, which we do or i do um it picks inside and then there's the post processing in in photoshop which is basically just making it into a pretty picture um the um what we do is we stack all of the hydrogen alpha images together uh, i think we we also got about 18 or 20 uh, images of the veil using the sulfur two filter and about the same in oxygen three and so after we've captured the object using these three different filters we then combine them to create a colored image uh, which is what you're seeing here the colored image uh, we call this the hubble palette which is 
assigning hydrogen alpha to green, the sulfur two to red, and the oxygen three to the blue. And I also did another um, picture of this one. Using just the oxygen three, which was assigned to blue, uh, the hydrogen alpha that was assigned to red, and the oxygen three was also assigned to green at an opacity of about 50%. Um, so that was, that was one of the images that we, that we captured just recently. And I want to show you another one that we did recently with the same set up where is it system one no wrong one wrong camera okay which way this is the one I was looking for. <clears throat> now, these were all uh, objects that we captured up until um, about two months ago, um, just during the summer season. And I want to show you. Not that one. Ah, here we go. Okay, it takes a little while to load. This is the North American Nebula or part of it. Um, and the Pelican Nebula, oh, it doesn't work too well if I invert it. Okay, here's the Pelican Nebula and I'm going to try and increase the brightness on this. Oops. No, that didn't. Okay, that's not looking too good. I don't know why. I did that. Okay, hang on a second. All right, okay. Um, this particular image again was captured in hydrogen alpha. Um, using a different camera on the same telescope before we um, moved over to the QHY600, which is a, a monochrome uh, camera. Uh, this one was using the QHY367 Pro C, which is um, the 36 megapixel um, one shot color camera. And for those of you that do astrophotography, um, you're probably wondering, well, why, how can we shoot this in hydrogen alpha uh, with a color camera? Well, the camera is sens a very sensitive camera. And, you know, what I can tell you is for the last couple of years, we've been using the, uh, this particular camera on the Takahashi. And um, oh, wait a minute, what's this? Window update, great, go away. Um, we've been using the 
QHY367 one-shot colour camera on this telescope for the last couple of years. And I first started experimenting with in narrow band when we got the camera and we ended up putting a filter wheel on it because the results are just so good in narrow band. They're just really amazing um, that we can capture um, hydrogen, alpha, oxygen and sulfur, even though the camera has a Bayer matrix um, rather than just a um, a straight monochrome um, sensor. So again, we did we did quite long exposures on this, uh, fifteen minute long exposures, and got quite a lot of detail in the Great Wall of Cygnus and um, and the Pelican and. I think we we did about the same amount of exposures, and this is the end result after stacking uh, those images. This is a Hubble palette view with the sulfur assigned to red, um, hydrogen alpha assigned to green, and the oxygen assigned to blue and then I just recently processed the same object uh, in bicolor um, assigning the um, H-alpha to red and the O3 to the blue and a blend of O3 for the green channel. Okay so um, that's about it. Uh, does anyone have any questions at all? Hey, uh, Terry, this is uh, Robert Foster. I got a few questions about your um, different observatories out there. Um, I'm, I'm giving some consideration to trying to make my own someday uh, when I'm rich and famous. Um, but it looks like you've got three different kind of structures out there. You've got the roll-off roof and then the two domes, but the two domes seem to be different. One of them looks like it kind of opens like a clamshell, and the other one's got like a vertical slit. Is that correct, or are the two domes the same? Yeah, no, uh, Robert, yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, <clears throat> the... Um, uh, The Air Force uh, Dome, uh, the Falcon, um, is an astro haven, which yes, that is a clamshell design. Um, when I first started looking at domes, uh, I was I was not too keen on on the um, uh, on the clamshell design because I figured that. Um, you know, it would be, um, uh, we get quite a lot of wind here and I thought that, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be offering us that great, um, uh, protection and because the whole thing is basically, uh, wide open, just like the roll off roof. Uh, you've got the north and the south sides to the um, to the clamshell opening up, um, but you know when when the guys were here putting that together, you know we we built the walls um, first. The walls are only um, I think five foot high, and um, that was all uh, finished and prepared. And the guys came along from the Air Force Academy and we had a crane here uh, to put the telescope in. But basically they put that together in a day. Now we got the, um, um, our science dome, which belongs to 
Grand Mesa Observatory and, and the founder, uh, John Manza and his wife donated all that money for the Science Dome to get this working. We've, we've had that in place now for uh, well, close to two years, Isaac, be right. Um, and we still have problems with it. Now, perhaps user error can be um, part of the problem, but it's not been easy to get this thing to work. And um, having a rotating dome with a slit or a shutter like, like what we've got is certainly going to off, offer you more protection from the wind. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, the simplicity of the clamshell, um, in hindsight, I think that's the direction that we would have gone had we known about some of these issues. Okay. And uh, can you give me a rough idea of what those things cost? Yeah, the... Um, I think the Astro Haven, the last time I looked, so that one here is about, I think it's 12 foot or 12 and a half foot. And just a rough idea, I think they're around 40,000. Yeah, okay. Um, the um, uh, the Podmax, um, which is made by Skyshed in Canada, uh, that cost us 30,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that's also 12 foot, uh, but that doesn't include, it doesn't include shipping even. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've got shipping on top of that and then you've got the cost involved. Well, whether it's an Astro Haven or a Podmax, you still got to put it in a concrete floor. Right. Um, and I think, I think all up, um, the pod max has probably cost us about, um, about 80,000, not including the equipment inside. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and then, then you've got the roll off roof and that's certainly a much simpler design. Looks like something, you know, a construction crew could put together. Um, I know a person wouldn't want something nearly as big as what you got there. Something about the size of the little shed that you're in right now would probably be enough for a, a single telescope. Um, did you get that constructed with all local resources or was that a kit that was brought in and built on site or? Yeah, we, um, we ended up getting it made locally. Um, initially we were going to use a guy, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but you can contact me um, by email um, and I can give you a name of the guy. Um, but he, we were going to give him the business that he, he goes around the country and builds a lot of uh, backyard observatories uh, of this style. Um, but we ended up, uh, this guy let us down um, and uh, uh, it just took him months to get back to us. Very poor communication. Mm. And we ended up going to um, Durango Skies uh, that are based um, in Durango, in Colorado, um, and they do, they make plans for observatories. Um, and I'm pretty sure if you just wanted a small observatory, they probably got plans already made that you can buy from them. Hmm. And then you can get just a local contractor to build it to his specifications. Okay. That's what we did with this. We got we got Durango Skies to supply the plans. We paid them for the plans. And then we got a local contractor out of Grand Junction uh, to build the observatory at the same time as, it, as he built the house. Okay. All right, that's cool. 
So of those three different designs, do you think the clamshell is overall the best or? Um, if you don't get a lot of wind where you live, uh, I think, um, uh, I think it would be a good option, but you limp. The problem with, with a clamshell or a, or any type of dome, like if you want to put in two piers, you really can't with a dome. Yeah. You're limited to just one setup. You know, you could have multiple telescopes on that pier, of course, but um, I think having a roll-off roof, uh, it certainly gives us a lot more flexibility. You know, we've got six mounts um, in the roll-off and, um, you know, it's, it's utilizing that area. Um, I don't think there would be much uh, difference between the price of um, a dome and a roll-off roof. Um, if you were to... Um, but depending on the size, you know, like you could probably build a, um, a 10 by 12 mm -hmm. foot observatory for about the same price as, as a um, Astro Haven. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm thinking of, I've got a place uh, up above Cedar Ridge, about 8,200 feet on the south side of the Mesa. Beautiful skies. Um, but it is windy up there. So uh, a roll off roof would be probably better under those sort of circumstances. It, if it's windy, no. If it's windy, you, your best option would be to have a dome with a, with a shutter, like our PodMax dome. Oh, the Canadian one, the one with just a vertical slit, huh? Right, that's gonna give you most protection from the wind. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, there are several companies here in the US that make uh, those types of domes. You're not just stuck with um, um, Canada. Sky, uh, what's it, um, sky shed. Yeah, but if you want to, um, if you want to contact me uh, by email, um, I'll gladly give you the names of some other manufacturers. Okay. That's cool. It's very helpful. I enjoyed your talk there and those those pictures you're showing there at the end are absolutely amazing. That looks like something out of a science fiction novel. You know, it's hard to believe that stuff is, is actually Which out Which pictures? There. What, the, um, the, the veil? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's um, when we have, when we have good sky here, when we don't have the smoke or the clouds, um, uh, it really is a fun place to be. Um, are you a member of the Astronomy Club, Robert? Yeah, yeah, sure am. Oh, okay. I'm yeah, not sure. I'm not sure if I've ever before, uh, talked to you. I'm sorry. Yeah, we met before. You were at the uh, telescope workshop, and then uh, last year, I forget. What oh, okay. It was there yeah. was a. There was a session out there at the Grand Mesa Observatory. I remember it being a really cold night, and there was a couple of teenagers with shorts and sandals on, and they must have been freezing. But um, nice right. setup you have out there. It's really, really cool to have that resource. Yeah, well, hopefully next year we'll be able to resume that. Um, you know, I don't mind having the Zoom meetings, but it's really not the same thing. You know, it's um, people want to come up here. And uh, I find it, I found it amazing that uh, um, I, I've been inundated with phone calls this week from people thinking that we were having a public event here tonight. I'm, I try to be fairly clear when we when we promote the uh, Zoom events, but um, yeah, I'm not sure that we will be having any more. Uh, Zoom events this year uh, or not, we might be taking a break 
Uh, I'm going to talk to Nancy, the club president, and Isaac about that. But um, but yeah, hopefully next year we can start um, having some um, person to person contact with the public events. All right. So do we have any other questions at all? I have a question. Yes, Christy. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I was always assuming, you know, when looking at some of these pictures, like the picture you have up now that, um, when I was listening to you earlier that, you know, you had assigned like the blue and the green and the reds to some of these colors, um, and that these are what these actually looked like, you know, out in space. And right. So if we were actually out in space, um, you know, just seeing these in magazines and stuff, what would we actually be seeing if we looked at one of these nebulas? I mean, just kind of like maybe the white and gray picture like you showed us originally? Um, let me just go back to one of those pictures. I'm just going to bring it up. Um, is it still on the screen? Uh, the real colorful, the real pretty colorful one is. Oh, okay. All right. Um, uh, I'm just going to bring it up again. I don't know why I can't see it. But thank you. I found that very interesting, you know, as you was explaining some of the colors were assigned. And I guess I, I found that really interesting. I, I never knew that. <laughs> Christy, this... Right. Christy, this is Nancy. I just wanted to make a comment. The um, different nebula, the different parts of the nebula that you see here, the red areas are taken in hydrogen, which the human eye does not see, but the bluish areas are called reflection nebula, and they reflect the light of the stars that are nearby. So if it's a bluish colored star, it mm -hmm. will reflect that um, bluish color. Um, that's just my comments. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, are you able to see the screen? I'm just showing some other um, photographs. Yeah. Uh, there's a picture on the screen now of the uh, Eagle Nebula. Yes. And yes. This one is a more natural looking image. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we don't know for sure what, you know, we, we're not going to know in our lifetime uh, what these objects look like if we were to see them uh, in a space from a spaceship. But um, the um, uh, we're probably going to see them if we were in a spaceship close to the Eagle Nebula. Uh, it's probably not going to look like it is here, but we probably going to see the similar colors. This is actually captured in natural color, but we've added uh, hydrogen to it. Okay. Um, so it's it's a more natural type of image than, than the Hubble palette. Okay, okay. The Hubble palette, which so we've got this one here, which is a wide field uh, mm. picture of the North American Nebula again, taken with another camera, but a much wider field. Um, and this is the Hubble palette. The Hubble palette um, image or, or, or the name is derived from the Hubble telescope. And uh, when, when the Hubble telescope uh, started taking pictures, um, they did a lot of their um, images using this uh, Hubble palette. So this is where the name comes from, is from the Hubble telescope. Right, correct. And, um, uh, and you know, it's become, it's become a very popular um, color scheme, if you like, uh, for photographers to use around the world. Um, I really like doing the processing in in this style 
of imagery rather than the typical color. This is a again more of a typical color what it possibly could look like um, if you were flying by in a spaceship. This is just a you know regular color. Again, we've added the hydrogen alpha filter to it to the red. Uh, but it's looking more natural. But the thing with the with the Hubble palette, uh, we're using these three uh, narrowband filters, the oxygen, the sulfur, and the hydrogen. It brings out a lot of um, invisible gases that you just can't see right. in a regular colored image. Like more depth to it too, yes. Yep. So, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Frank also just pointed out that the images are taken over long time periods and they integrate more detail and light, of course, than you can see with the human eye. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, um, when, I'm, when I'm taking pictures of uh, objects in the night sky, uh, we're taking multiple exposures. Um, I think in the latest picture of the veil, I did something like 24 uh, 10 minute exposures, um, which is, um, uh, was that four hours or close to four hours? Um, and about the same, if we look, if I go down here, uh, we look at the total time uh, to take this photograph was 15 hours. Oh, yes. So we, we're actually taking photographs um, of these objects over multiple nights. We point the telescope at exactly the same object um, over several nights. And, and then, you know, after we've captured all of the the photographs, we have to stack them all together and then combine them and then we mm -hmm. come up with this this type of a picture. Right, very interesting. All right, anyone else? If I may. Yes, go ahead. I was just wondering, I mean, I've been reading some of the reports that have come out regarding the whole satellite system being launched by SpaceX. Are you guys concerned that it's going to start hindering your view or the actual scientific research that you try to accomplish with that much stuff floating around? I mean, we're already pretty crowded up there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, Are you talking about Elon Musk's Starlink? Yes, sir. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, the Starlink. Yeah, so... Um, yes, unfortunately, you know, the... Um, this is something that I'm personally not happy about at all. Um, now, it doesn't affect us so much here as um, scientific astronomers. You know, what, what I'm doing... Uh, although we have scientific equipment here, um, a lot of what we do is just um, taking short exposures and stacking them. And fortunately, the software that we use can take out the satellite trails. Um, so it doesn't affect me so much. That doesn't mean to say that I don't, I don't care about um, the planet. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I think that what has happened with Elon Musk um, is a terrible situation where he was able to put up, uh, um, I think he's already put up um, quite a number of satellites, but I believe the total goal is that he's going to be putting up about 12,000 satellites. I find it totally disgraceful that He's allowed um, to put up satellites into space. Nobody owns space. You know, it, it should have gone to some form 
of an international body, uh, perhaps an international body of astronomers uh, before it was allowed uh, because it's affecting astronomers uh, worldwide um, all for the sake of providing uh, internet for a, a few remote areas. Nobody was consulted about about this. I think it's just total disgrace. But, you know, if you've got money, which he has, um, you can do anything. So There were 40,000 satellites. He's already launched a couple of thousand of them. Right. Yeah, it's going to be a total of 40,000. Yeah, and I, I think there's also several other companies or consortiums uh, overseas that are wanting to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I appreciate the insight. I've actually been curious to hear a professional's opinion on it rather than just what I read online. Yeah, well, that's my personal opinion on it anyway. Um, you know, I get people call me um, um, all the time and say, um, you know, we had, uh, we had a guy call us a few weeks ago. I thought, thought he saw a UFO. Um, and we see these, um, um, these Starlink uh satellites they're grouped uh there's a number of satellites together i believe i haven't seen one uh i think isaac has seen one if you're still there isaac um not sure if you're still listening or not but i had a guy up at the observatory that was doing some work for us a couple of days ago and he saw uh he said he saw 50 lights all in a row and I would imagine that's probably, uh, you know, two or three of these satellites linked together. Well, fortunately, they're in a lower orbit than, um, um, like, the Webb um, satellite, which is in a further away right. orbit. So I think it's going to mostly be affecting um, amateur astronomers. Yep. Well, um, I can't, I can't point you to a link, um, but there was a, um, trying to think where I got it now. There was a, there was a report that came out, um, a couple of weeks ago on, on that and, um, yeah, a body of, professional astronomers got together uh, to do a report on it and they found that um, uh, it, it, it's going to affect them quite quite a lot, um, especially the professional um, astronomers that are using telescopes for scientific research that don't have the luxury of stacking their images together like we do. Um, so for them, uh, it, it's a lot tougher. Is there a petition or something we can sign? Um, there's been several that have been going around. Um, but, but to be honest with you, uh, the astronomy community um, is, is a too small a community. I don't think that any petition would uh, really make much difference. Uh, Nancy, would you like to comment on that? I think Nancy's gone. Um, yeah, no, you know. I'm here. I'm here. Um, I, I agree with your comments that, well, unfortunately, first, the way of the world is what rich people want, rich people get. And number two, uh, I agree with Terry, the astronomy community. Um, both professional and amateur, is too small in the bigger picture of things. Unfortunately, a lot of humans on the planet don't care about the night sky or even look up there. So the people that are against light pollution or against the satellites are an even smaller subset of um, 
of people that are interested in the sky. So yeah, the clout just doesn't seem to be there. And in the current political climate, science doesn't usually win out over politics these days. So we're in a bad spot right now. Yes, we are. Yeah, uh, but if you, um, if you, Neil or anyone wants to email me, I'll dig out a couple of links. Um, there's one which is a petition, uh, which I can send to you, uh, and another one which was a, a, a report from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but if, um, if you and anyone else wants to email me, um, and I'll dig out that information and send it back to you, and you can email me at terry at grandmesaobservatory.com. Thank you, Terry. No problem at all. All right, anyone else? I'd just like to uh, apologize for anybody who knows earlier me uh, letting out a burp there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I wanted to say thanks. I really like this Zoom meeting tonight, and I don't know a lot of, lot about this stuff, but uh, I love Colorado. I've been there many, many times in my life uh, on family vacations when I was younger. But I don't live in Colorado, so um, this was very very interesting and very neat for me to join this Zoom meeting with all of you tonight. Well, thank you, Christy. And um, I want to thank you, everybody, for um, for coming along tonight. Um, as I was saying earlier, I hope next year that we can, we can see you all face to face at a public event. And um, I want to thank Chris for uh, moderating um, Nancy, the Western Colorado Astronomy Club president, and Isaac Garfinkel uh, for helping tonight put this together. And um, hope you come back and join us soon. I'm going to let you, I'm going to pass it over to you. I think you, you have to close the meeting, Nancy. Well, again, I would just echo um, your thanks to everybody. Um, this wouldn't be any fun to do if all of you didn't participate. And it's good to see people interested in science and astronomy. And again, please feel free to visit us in person once the crisis has passed. Um, Christy, too, if you're visiting the area. And uh, log on to our Astronomy Club monthly meetings if you're interested, and for our GMO monthly, if we continue them for the season. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for participating. And thanks to Terry for, for doing the, the long tour of the observatory and the astrophotography session. Thank you, thank you very much. Where is Grand Mesa by? It's near Whitewater, Colorado. Um, we're up on the side of the Mesa in one, Grand Mesa in one of the valleys up outside of Whitewater, Colorado. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Had a good time watching. All right, everybody. Thanks and have a good evening. Stay safe. You too. Bye bye. I was watching, doing a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Bye.